To find an upper bound using the nearest neighbor algorithm, what we're always looking to do is travel from any vertex to its nearest neighbor. First of all, we've got to construct a table of minimum connectors. This is not just the length of the arcs between two vertices, but rather it is the shortest distance from one vertex to another. When you're constructing this table, make sure you're very careful in ensuring that you have got the minimum distance between each pair of vertices. We then take it in turn, choosing each vertex as our starting node, and then travel around, always find the nearest neighbor. What I'm going to do is I'm going to follow the process through with one, starting with A, and then I'm going to present the results starting with each of the other vertices. You may want to do this yourself as an exercise to ensure that you can find the minimum distance. And as a warning, one of the vertices when you start with it gives a slightly peculiar result depending on how you look at it. So starting with vertex A, we look down the column headed with an A. We look for the smallest number in that column. In this case it's B. That means B is the nearest neighbour to A. So we travel that way. What I would then advise on doing is crossing out the row and column headed with A. We're not going to consider those again, so it makes sense to get rid of them. We're now at B, so now we need to look down the row beginning with B. Notice that this is a little bit like Prim's algorithm, except in Prim's algorithm we would be looking down both A and B columns. Here we're just looking down B to find its nearest neighbour that has not already been selected. In this case it's G, we can travel there for 8. We're going to cross out the row and column headed with B. And next we're going to look at G. The nearest neighbour to G is 6 away, it is F. So we're going to cross out G now and move to F. Nearest neighbour for F is 14, it's D. We don't want to look at F any longer, so we're going to cross out those rows and columns and move to looking down the D column. Nearest neighbour is E for 5, get rid of D. Look down the E column, it's H for 3, get rid of the E row and column. And now we're looking down H, and of course there's only one left because we've got the other seven vertices represented so far, so it must be C. Now we still need to travel back to our starting vertex, we've got to get back to A, and so very simply we look for the distance from our current position, C to A, which is 24 in this case. Even though it's crossed out, we still need to pay attention to this value as it will give us a tour that starts and ends at A. When we add up all of these values, we get 71. Now this would be a sensible upper bound, but we do need to see if we can do better. The way that we do this is we repeat the process, but not starting with vertex A, starting with each of the other vertices in turn. With each of these others, I'm not going to go through the process of how we find them, but I will present the list of vertices in order and the total. I would advise having a go yourself to make sure that you can find the same paths that I did. Be warned, one of them gives you a slightly peculiar result that you need to think quite carefully about. I'll talk about that when I get to it. Starting with B, we get 72. This is not as good as starting with A. This would give us a higher upper bound. We actually want the lowest possible upper bound, so this is not going to be the upper bound from this process. Starting with C, we improve our upper bound to 69. With D, we get 71 again. With E, we get 78. Very bad to start with E. Starting with F, we get 71. And starting with G, we have a slight problem. When we do G, we go from G to F for a total of 6. And then when we're at F, if we look down the F column, we can see that we can get to both B and D in a distance of 14. We don't just choose at random because we run the risk of missing out on a better answer. Remember, we're looking to improve our upper bound. So what we have to do is we have to follow both of them through and see which one is the better one. So if we follow through from B, we get this route for a total of 71. If we follow through from D, we get this route for a total of 68. And this is actually the best upper bound that we've found so far. So we definitely need to ensure that we consider both. Now this situation won't come up too often, but it's definitely worth thinking about. If you have two options, follow them both. And finally, starting with vertex H, we get 70. So a slight improvement, but still not quite as good as 68. So this is our best route. 
Starting with vertex G, we can get an upper bound of 68. Remember, we're looking for the lowest upper bound. What this means is for this particular graph, we've got some upper and lower bounds. Now, the upper and lower bounds I'm about to present were calculated in other videos. I will link them in the description below. But so far, we have a lower bound using the minimum spanning tree method of 64. That means we know that whatever the best solution to the travelling salesman problem is, we can't do it in less than 64. There could be an answer that is 64, we don't know, but we just know that it can't be done in less than 64. Hence on my diagram I've indicated from 64 and to the right. The upper bound we got using the minimum spanning tree earlier was 71. This means that at that point we knew that we did not need more than 71 in order to find the solution. So we managed to limit the solution being between 64 and 71. We don't know what the solution is, it may be possible in 71, it may be possible in 64, it may be possible somewhere in between. We don't know, but we know that our optimal solution is somewhere in there. Using the nearest neighbour method, we've managed to improve our upper bound to 68. This means that we've managed to change from 71 down to 68. We've restricted what our bounds are. Before, we knew that we didn't need more than 71. Now we know that we don't need more than 68. We've now got a shorter set of limits over what the optimal solution must be. Somewhere between 64 and 68. And actually we've got a solution which is 68. When working with this problem, if we can find a solution that's lower than 68, that's going to put it pretty close to our lower bound. And so we may conclude that an answer of 67 or even 66 or 65, we may conclude that that is actually the optimal solution or optimal enough for whatever we are trying to work on. So when working with the nearest neighbour method, first thing you've got to be careful of is constructing that table of minimum connectors. And the second thing is making sure that you do find the nearest neighbour each time for each of the starting vertices. Be very careful if you have options and just make sure that you follow them through. Other than that, it is a fairly straightforward algorithm, not too many stages, nothing too complicated, but good luck when using it. <laughs> <laughs>